This is the V Spot. Uh, it's March 14th, 2014. I'm talking to Dell the Patriot Wilkes, a uh, former professional wrestler. Uh, how are you doing, Dell? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. I'm real glad to finally be able to talk to you. I've been watching a lot of your new, uh, All Japan matches. Well, I appreciate that. I, um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed my time uh, working in Japan. As a matter of fact, of all the places and all the companies that I worked for, my my favorite place was working in Japan. I worked with some great guys over there and a great company. Yeah, I really I saw a match you and the Eagle had with Misawa and Kawada, and I just thought that was a really great tag team match. Well, I had good people to work with. Uh, uh, you know, working against the Japanese guys who I thought were the best in the world. Uh, they were tough. Uh, they were easy to work with, and of course, uh, the Eagle. You know, Jackie. Yeah. Uh, Great guy, uh, you know, good worker, hard worker, tough guy. So when you've got people like that to work with and to work against, uh, you usually end up having pretty good matches or pretty decent matches. Uh, let me ask you, this is kind of jumping ahead here, but I'm curious, when you were working in Japan, were you working as a heel? Well, over there, it's, it's neither. Uh, you know, when I worked for Baba, uh, it was a little different. Things were done a little differently uh there were clean finishes every week. Somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. got their hand raised. Somebody got a one, two, three count. There was no outside interference. There was no DQs. There was no anything like that. <laughs> Excuse me. And there was no baby face, no heel. Uh, you know, it, it, it just, they didn't do it that way on our, our TV shows that came on every week. was nothing but wrestling. There was no interviews. There was no talking with the wrestlers. So it's a little different than most wrestling fans have seen things done. But you could go to a town one night and you might be received as a, a heel, uh, I guess, per se. And the next night you go to a different town. You might be in any face. But really, they, as long as the match was good, the action was good, they, there really wasn't a heel baby face attitude with that crowd uh, that attended all Japan shows. You know, I guess the reason I was asking was because I guess because seeing you in America, you were always kind of you were always a really good guy, and in Japan, you seem to have more of a mean streak. Well, and I tell you why, it, it, it was a much more physical form uh, of of work over there. We sold tickets. People watched our TV show based not on the other thing. It was all about what was done in the ring. Now. Therefore, because of that, it was a much more physical style of work. It was a lot harder on you physically, a lot harder on your body, but you could be a lot more aggressive. You wanted to, you wanted to portray. As a matter of fact, they expected it. And, and the next time you're watching any all Japan tapes, watch and notice how emotionless there was no emotion from Masawa, Kawada. Now Kabashi would show emotion. Yeah. But Kawe, any of those guys showed absolutely no emotion, and that's just their nature. That's the way Japanese do things. But they wanted the Americans. They, they liked the Americans to be spirited, to be animated, to be aggressive. I mean, they just loved it. They would, uh, I remember time and time again, leaving the ring, walking back to the dressing room, or coming from the dressing room to the ring, and a Japanese put his hand on you and grabbed you. And you could just turn around and, basically knock his teeth down his throat, uh, bust his nose, black his eye, and they loved it. I mean, they absolutely loved it. So they expected and wanted to see uh, more aggression out of the Americans because they didn't see that out of their guys. When you went, because you did your first run in All Japan in like 92, 93, you went to WCW, and was it hard to adjust going back to an American style I had come from an American style. Um, actually, the very first time I went to Japan was in 1990 as the trooper. And uh, I just wasn't prepared for that type of work. I was still green. Um, so I didn't go back until 1992 as the Patriot. But, uh, it, you know, it didn't take me long to to get back into the American way of doing things. Uh, my body needed a break. Uh, it's, it's very tough physically on, on the guys that worked in Japan. So, you know, maybe initially it was a little different, but uh, it really didn't. I mean, I, I adapted pretty well. I, I, uh, that's what I was brought up in, what I was training in was the American way of doing things, sort of that walking and talking and, and stuff like that. So I adapted pretty quick. 
<laughs> yeah, I know in WCW you wrestled Vader a couple of times, and I'm assuming that's probably not much different from All Japan. No, it wasn't. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I've had a cold, but no. And I tell you, Vader had a reputation. It's been sort of rough, but the uh, very first time I worked with him at WCW, he crowbarred me pretty good. So I popped him right back upside the head as hard as I could, and that's basically just a way of saying, hey, man, you need to lighten up. And he did. And I never had a problem with him after that. I worked with him in uh, WWE several times. And, and matter of fact, for a brief period of time in WWE, we uh, tagged up together on yep. a few shows. But, no, I, uh, but yeah, you're correct. I mean, I never had a problem with him, but he was a little bit more like old Japan than what I was accustomed to. Uh, if I can go back a little bit, when you first, how did you first get into the wrestling business? Well, I uh, living. I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. Played football at the University of South Carolina, and I always been a big wrestling fan. I grew up on Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling, and uh, you know, watching uh, A. Jacobs and Paul Jones and Wahoo McDaniel and. And uh, the guys like that. And uh, so I, I just a huge, huge fan. I went to my very first show in 1970 at the Township Auditorium here in Columbia and saw Jack and Jerry Briscoe take on Rip Hawk and Sweet Hampton. And I mean, I, I just was addicted almost from there. So I knew that whatever football ended for me, whether it was after college or after the NFL, I had a couple of trials in the NFL that didn't work out. So I came back to Columbia. Uh, Columbia is also the home, or was the home, of Lillian Ellison, uh, who worked as the fabulous Mula. And she had a school in Columbia to train uh, for wrestlers. And it was really more geared toward girls. Yeah. There had been some guys that had gone through it, but it was the only option I had here in Columbia. And uh, there were some guys that helped train me that, that would uh, she would uh, run on some of her local shows. So uh, that's where I got my basic training. Probably not very good training, but, you know, I learned the basics there, and uh, that's where I started. I would think you're probably her uh, most famous uh, male graduate, aren't you? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And uh, now she had some famous girls that went through there, but like I said, or like you said, I was, you know, I guess the most well-known guy that, that, that went through her school. How would the training uh, differ? Uh, were you in classes with other girls, or what, did she have a class for men and women? No, I, I, the whole time I trained, I never saw a girl in the ring. It was just, uh, uh, I had a job at the time. I was in sales with a company here in Columbia. As soon as I'd get off work, I'd go to the gym and work out. And as soon as I got out of the gym, we'd head straight out to Moolah's. And uh, a buddy of mine that graduated from the Civil Military School in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, he broke into the business with me, so we would go out there, and uh, typically we wouldn't get there until 9 o'clock at night, because I worked a full-time job, and I and, uh, had to get in the weight room first, and then we'd go out there. But those guys that uh, uh, she would use on her shows, uh, they would they would help train us, and you know they were probably very limited in their knowledge, but again, it was the only option I had living here in Columbia. Uh, how did you uh, get to, uh, was Memphis your first territory you got to work? Was whose? Memphis. Yeah, it was the first territory, well, yeah, it was, uh, actually. Um, let me, no, 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 let, let me back up, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, actually, the first territory that I worked was for Vern Gagne, the AWA, uh, Moola ran a show here in Columbia, ran it at an old skating rink, and she brought in Wahoo uh, to work, uh, work on top of that work main event. I don't remember who he worked with, probably one of her guys. But um, at the time, Wahoo was in Charlotte for a few weeks where he lived, but he was also staying up in Minneapolis. He was booking for Vern Gagne and working for Vern Gagne. Well, on the show that night, uh, we met, and uh, we hit it off. Wahoo was a good dude, man, and he uh, always had sort of a soft place in his heart for 
new guys, young guys in the business, guys that he thought had promise. And um, we also had something else in common that really helped us bond, and that was that high school, college, pro football background. And uh, it just really took a liking to me. And uh, so I went up and spent probably about four months living up in Minneapolis, uh, renting a room from Brad Ringens, and uh, working shows for a uh, firm, but I was just doing it as Dell Wills. And from there, uh, I came home for Christmas, and they just didn't really have enough going on at the time for yeah. I could be up there full time uh, and make money. So I came back home, and I don't remember how it happened, but somehow uh, I ended up working in Memphis. So that was probably the second territory I worked with would have been Memphis. You uh, teamed with Scott Steiner there, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, they started out, uh, I guess, throughout my whole career, everybody's always tried to tell me something. When I first started working for Moolah, uh, my buddy and I that graduated from the Citadel, she put us under hoods, and we were called the Masked Grapplers. Well, when I went to work for, uh, in Memphis, the first thing I did was, and it was Lawler's idea, it was called the Dreamweaver, and I had a mask. Well, then they put me together with Scott Steiner, and we were called the Wrestling Machines, and I was under a mask. And, of course, later on, I worked as a Patriot under a mask, so I guess they were trying to tell me I had a face made for a mask. I was probably better off covering it up. But, yeah, I did work with Scott. Uh, we tagged together. Funny, we had a good crew there. Guys that went on to have good careers. Scott was there. Yeah. Uh, Sid was there. Brian Lee was there. Uh, of course, Jeff Jarrett was there. And uh, uh, Mark was there, Undertaker. Yeah. Of course, he was, obviously wasn't doing the Undertaker gimmick, but we were all young guys breaking into the business. But, uh, you know, some good young talent there. And the godfather, Papa Shango, turned up there around that time. He did. Yes, he sure did. He came through. And, of course, we had some of the older guys there, but... Uh, you know, Dundee and, 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 and Lawler and, um, what's it, Dutch Mantel was and there. And Robert Fuller. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Phil, uh, what was Phil's name? P.Y. Hickerson. Phil, uh, yeah, Phil Hickerson. And, uh, so there was, uh, you know, it was a good group of people there. It was, uh, I starved to death. Uh, you know, they weren't drawing anybody. And, um, it, it was tough, tough, man. I mean, you know, our biggest house was always Monday night in Memphis, and we'd go to Louisville on Tuesday nights at Louisville Garden. We'd go to Evansville on Wednesday night, and then uh, the rest of the nights were just spot shows, and we'd be back in Nashville on Saturday. We'd actually have TV in Memphis on Saturday at a TV studio, and then um, have to be back in Nashville that night to work the Nashville Fairground. But, um, and, you know, we were paid based on where we were at on the card and based on the, the gate. And, uh, the most money I ever made in the night there was 50 bucks. I, oh. Uh, yeah, Evansville, Indiana, man, I made 15, 20 bucks. You might make 30 bucks in Louisville, but oh yeah, I about starved there for you now. Yeah, uh, did you ever hear that? Uh, I heard the story that when Jerry Jarrett started working with the WWF in 92, that he came in the locker room, gave the guys a speech about how they can't do drugs, and Dutch Mantel said, Jerry, you don't pay us enough to do food. <laughs> I didn't hear that, but that's. Uh, you know, I'm telling you, man, I, I, I literally had a had a few days off. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 had, I had to come back to Columbia. I knew a guy that worked at the bank. And I had bought a car, and, and I'd gone through him to, to, to borrow the money uh, to pay for the car. And so I had, you know, had good standing with him. And I literally had to take out a small loan just so I could afford gas, hotel, and food, man. And, and there were some times... I didn't get a hotel. I can't tell you how many times after the show uh, I would drive to the next town or close to the next town, and uh, I'd pull into a, a you know rest area, and uh, I had my pistol in my lap. I locked my doors and I'd go to sleep. And I'd get up the next morning. I'd go find me a place to eat. I'd go find the gym where I could work out and where I could take a shower. I couldn't afford it, so I slept in my car a lot. What did you uh, learn? Did Memphis help you learn a lot about working? Repeat that, please. Did Memphis help you? Uh, did you learn a lot about wrestling in Memphis? Learning how to work? 
I apologize. I didn't understand the question. Oh, I said in Memphis, uh, did you learn a lot? Oh. No, that's, uh, that's all right. That, no, I was just saying, did you get any, uh, in, when you were working in Memphis, did you gain experience? Oh, 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 okay, I apologize. That's all right. Um, I'm on the road, and, and, you know, I got traffic around me. Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, I was sort of behind the eight ball anyway, because you take a lot of guys that went through WCW school, the Monster Factory, or uh, Sharps school, they probably got much better training than I did. I was trained by guys that never made a nickel in this business. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure it showed. But, uh, yeah, I did. I learned things there. Uh, absolutely. I feel like I learned something at every, you know, at every stop along the way. Um, I, I tried to be sponge-like and, and take things in and watch and learn. But, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't... Uh, you know, it was it wasn't a bad experience. It was just one where I couldn't make any money, and, and, and basically I was one broke trying to work there. I hey, listen when they fired me. I, I was relieved. They came in one day and they had this old skinny guy that I don't know, he, about six foot three, weighed about one hundred and thirty pounds. Guy named Randy Hell. I don't know where his wrestling knowledge came from, but uh, he was sort of one of the bookers there. And he came in one day and told me that I just you know needed to head back home. They didn't think I was you know, had a career in that business, and I didn't say anything, but I wanted to go, man, thank you. At least I can go home now and get three meals a day, have a bed to sleep in. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Sometimes you're in a situation where you don't necessarily want to quit, but, you know, because you, you don't want to quit, but you're you're happy somebody stops you. Oh, yeah, and I knew I wasn't going to quit, and I wouldn't discourage that they, you know, let me go and, and fired me, and... Um, but I knew I'd get back home and I'd find another place to go. I knew I still had that connection with water. And uh, so I could get back up and work with Vern and them if things picked up, which I eventually did. That's where, uh, you know, the trooper gimmick uh, came along. But so, yeah, uh, you know, I wasn't discouraged, but a little bit relieved. At least I could get home and have three hours in the car. When you got to the AWA, who came up with the trooper gimmick? Well, they did. Uh, one of Moolah's guys that helped train me uh, worked full-time as a deputy sheriff and still does in, in one of the neighboring counties here. So when he worked, you know, those shows that Moolah would run just here in the area, high schools or National Guard armories, he would work as the super enforcer. He was a cop in real life, so he had the outfit, he had everything. Well, <clears throat> he called me one day when I was up there working for Vern and them. And I was just doing, working as Bill Wilkes, and I was back. Second time I've been up there. He said, hey, man, he said, if I send you a video tape, he said, would you mind passing it on to Wahoo? He said, you know, if you don't, if you don't, if you recall, I met him, but not you did, when he worked for Moolah down here. And I said, hey, man, I don't have a problem. His name's Alan. I said, send it up, and I'll give it to Wahoo. Well, he sent the tape up. I passed it off to Wahoo. About three or four days later, Greg called me into the office. He said, come in and he talked to you. He said, you know that tape you sent us? He said, uh, we have no interest in that guy. He said, you know, we, we don't think he's, he's right where he needs to be working weekends in Columbia, South Carolina. He goes, but we do like the idea of the gimmick. And uh, he said, we're thinking about, we got an idea. We want to see what you think about it. It's called the Trooper. You know, you're going to like a highway patrolman. You got that Southern accent. You know, he said, I, I think it'd be a perfect fit for you. Well, listen. If they were thinking about using me and, and putting a gimmick on me and giving me a push, I was all for it. You know, as long as I wouldn't have had to put a red wig on and, and a red nose on my face, I'd have, I'd have done anything. So um, I was all in. So that's where that came from. It was their idea through a tape that a buddy of mine sent. Uh, did, when he found out that you were going on TV with the gimmick, did he have a problem with it? Oh, oh yeah. And, and listen, he's a good dude and, and a good guy. And, and I could understand why he felt that way. And, and I told him, I said, man, I had no clue. I said, I did exactly what you asked me to do. You sent me the tape. I gave it to them. And I said, they were the ones that approached me about this. I said, you know, this wasn't my idea. It was theirs. And um, I think at first he didn't believe me, but, you know, I was telling the truth. Yeah, it's a, it had to be a pretty awkward position to be in. Yeah.
it was, and I, you know, I hated it for him, but listen, it was an opportunity for me. Yeah. Now, you ended up winning the AWA tag team titles, didn't you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, DJ Peterson and right. I were the very last tag team champs there. Uh, it wasn't very long after that um, that I went back to Japan, uh, maybe went to Japan as the trooper, uh, and then the company folded. But uh, yeah, DJ and I were the last uh, tag team champion, champions in the company. Uh, you won the belts from the Destruction Crew, right? Yeah, Anderson Bloom. Okay, now, do you remember why they put the belts on, on you? Because I remember they were champions for a long time, and I know they were even moonlighting in WCW under mask. Yeah, they were, but, um, you know, DJ was a good worker. He, he, he had some fire about him in the ring, and, and, of course, I was still green, but they felt like I had some potential and, you know, physically looked good. And um, so they, they just wanted to give us a push. They really didn't have any other, um, you know, Top babyface teams, they would bring people in occasionally, uh, but you know you can't bring you can't put a belt on somebody that you bring in and right. you know, it's on your TV show, but maybe once every six months it bring rock and roll in every now and then. So they needed a good young, uh, you know, babyface team, and, and they felt that it was you know the right thing to do at the time, I guess. Uh, after you got done with the AWA, did you mainly work in Japan before you got the global? Well, I went to Japan that one time in 1990, I think it was, and I worked as a trooper, and like I was telling you earlier, I was not prepared for what for what I saw when I got there. You know, those long matches with 15,000 false finishes and 15,000 kickouts and the, phys- the physicality of it, and, you know, I just wasn't prepared. I was still wet behind the ears, and... Um, so I, I I didn't hear from them for two years. They they wouldn't even contact me. All Japan would. But so I started working independent shows, um, and uh, then along came Global. Yeah, Global came up next. So um, I went to them, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember who got me booked there. I, well, it may have been Joe Petticino called me up. And, Said I've got an investor. We're gonna Bill Eby and I are, are gonna bring in some talent. We're we, we're gonna be on ESPN. We got the old AWA spot on ESPN from four to five o'clock Monday through Friday. And uh, so he said we're gonna send you a ticket and want you there for the first show, the first taping. And I went out with my trooper uh, stuff, my gimmick, because I thought that's what they wanted me to do. And um, I was in my room. We stayed at the at a roadway inn. All the talent did, and so did Joe and Bill and everybody. And uh, Bill called uh, Joe called my room. He said, "I need you to come over to my room." Bill and I are over here, and Bonnie Bonnie Blackstone. He said, "There's something we want to talk to you about." And uh, I said, "Okay." So I came on over. Now this is literally, you know, four or five hours before we're to go to the venue that night and tape and, and have our first show. For you know, we got a crowd there too. He said, there's a little old guy in uh, Georgia. His nickname's Poe Man. And he said he's just a weekend warrior. He's five foot nothing, and he's about as round as he is tall. And He, he does a, a character called the American Patriot. And it's red, white, and blue mask, red, white, and blue tights. And, and, and keep in mind, too, the timing of it. Wrestling has always done a good job of taking advantage of the political climate. You know, Russia during the Cold War, Nikita Koloff and Sergeant Slaughter, you know, uh, the Iron Sheik and Sergeant Slaughter, whatever was going on politically, internationally, you know, wrestling's always done a good job of, of taking advantage of that and having a good guy and a villain. And this is when Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, and we had gone into Kuwait to liberate Kuwait, and patriotism was, I mean, just through the roof in this country. And Joe and Bill said, look, man, we think this would be an unbelievable gimmick for you. And they already had a costume box there with the, with the tights and the mask that would fit me. And um, they said, would you do it? And uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. They said, listen, man, we want to give you a big push here. Uh, you know, and, and that night when I went down and walked through the curtain and went down the aisle there at the sportatorium, those people had never seen the 
hatred before. They had no idea who I was, and uh, that place erupted. Uh, and uh, I mean, it just it just took off. It blew up, and uh, we were convinced we'd made the right move. But no, that was their idea. I remember when I was about, uh, I think I was probably 10 or 11 when Global was on, because I remember I was amazed they had wrestling on weekday afternoons. Right. You know, because for a kid, you know, usually I had to wait Saturday. I always said the longest thing on Saturday was, was WF Superstars ending and WCW beginning. It was the longest five hours of the of the week. Oh, I know. But yeah, yeah you're right. You could watch it. You know, Global, uh, Monday through uh, Friday from 4 to 5. But, uh, yeah, and when I, I saw... Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say when I when I saw the Patriot come out, it was like I was immediately taken because it was such a cool look. It looked like a literally a superhero come to life. Yeah, you know, and, and the first few weeks I did it, it was it, it looked sort of odd. The outfit did uh, when they initially pulled uh, all the stuff out of that costume box they had had shipped to Dallas. There was a red, white, and blue tights. It was actually a red, white, and blue vest, a red, white, and blue mask, and then a red, white, and blue smokestack. Hat yeah, like Uncle Sam wears, uh, you know, like the black one Abe Lincoln wore and all those pictures. And I told him, I said, look, I'll wear every piece of that. I said, but I'm not putting that hat on my head. I said, I will like, <laughs> I will like send them a Dr. Seuss book. I'm not doing that. So you can keep that hat, put it back in that box, but I'll wear the rest of it. <clears throat> well, at the time, all I had was black boots. So about the first month, I was wearing black boots with red, white, and blue tights and a red, white, and blue mask. And it took me a while to order my red, white, and blue boots to go with it. So it was a little wild-looking combination there at first. Uh, when you were working there, uh, Bill Eady was the first booker there, wasn't he? Yeah, he and Joe Petticino, yeah. Uh, how was he to work with? Because uh, I'm a huge uh, Demolition fan, and I loved him as Mass Superstar. So I was curious, how was he to work with as a booker? Bill's a good dude. He's easy to get along with. He's got a lot of knowledge. He's you know, sort of a soft-spoken guy. He never gets, you know, his emotions are always on even keel. And um, I like Bill, uh, you know. Uh, been a few years. I saw him in Columbia six, seven years ago. Uh, but uh, it was easy. It was good to work for Bill. Did you ever get to work with him? Because I think he was working in Global as Access to the Demolisher. Yeah, I worked with him when, uh, the first few weeks when we were having that. <coughs> Excuse me, we were uh, Obviously, working in front of a live crowd there at the sportatorium, but we were, you know, filming everything and putting it in the camera. We could show it on TV later in the week. And they were doing this basically, what I was at, what most of us were, but, you know, he's working two or three times a night. Uh, it was sort of like a tournament, an elimination tournament to get down to the final two for the, uh, for the uh, <coughs> North American heavyweight belt, uh, as a TV belt. And uh, so, yeah, during that process, uh, I worked with Bill, I worked with uh, Soul Taker, who was, you know, eventually Papa Shango. I worked with, uh, I think, Haven. I worked with uh, Buddy Landell. I worked with Al Perez. I worked with Stan. Uh, what's Stan's name from, from uh, uh, Midnight Express? So, oh, 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 Lane. Stan Lane. So, yeah, I worked with a lot of good guys. And then they eventually, you know, it came down to me and Al Perez. And, um, uh, and they put the belt on me. But yeah, I worked with Bill during, during that process. How would they put, was, uh, I'm curious about different promotions. Uh, how was, how did Global go about putting their matches together? Would they, uh, were you given more freedom to do stuff in the ring or would they map it out? It was, you got to finish, uh, you know, from them the way they wanted the finish to happen. But after that, it's just up to you and the guy you're working with to go out there and, you know, have a match. But, Basically, the only you know only instructions we had was to finish. Here's what we need. Here's how we have to have it happen. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the finishes, the first time I, they put the belt on me, working against uh, Al Perez, it was supposed to be a deal where we're laying right near the ropes and. I'm covering out and the referee is, is counting and he doesn't see that it's one, two, and then right before the three count, Al puts his foot on the ropes, but the ref doesn't see it. He counts Al out. I get up and I've got the belt. They, you know, puts the belt on me and it, it doesn't bury Al. Uh, everybody on TV could see, everybody in the building could see that he had his foot on the rope, but the ref didn't see it. Well, the ref was a little green as well. 
Well, he actually looked up right before the count of three and saw Al's foot on the rope and counted him out anyway. So, you know, I jump up, and the place blows up, they're all excited, and they put the belt on me. Well, because it was a messed up finish, and the ref saw him and looked up when he wasn't supposed to, we did a deal where I, you know, I cut an interview, and I said, look, I will not take the belt under these circumstances. You know, I, I believe in doing things the American way, the right way, and, uh, you know, his foot was on the rope. I, I saw that clearly once I went back and looked at it on film, and I don't deserve the belt. I'm going to hand the belt back in, and we're going to do it again. And so, you know, it created a little angle there, and then we worked, worked um, uh, I guess, the next week or two weeks later, and they, they put the belt back on me. Well, it was one of those things, and this would go back to your WF run. You were always kind of a different kind of uh, baby face because you weren't as necessarily as aggressive or maybe xenophobic as some other patriotic characters. Like, I remember I always liked that in the WF because I felt like you were the only good baby faces in the WF in 97 because you said, you know, I don't have a problem with Canadians or anybody. No, and, and that was, you know, I felt like the way the, the, the character should be presented. And, you know, in, in a lot of my interviews, you know, I, I made the point that, you know, to me, patriotism is love of country. And, you know, there are no boundaries for that. I mean, it, that just doesn't exist inside the boundaries of our country. I mean, people all over the world, a lot of them love where they're from. They love their country. So patriotism is all over the world. And, I, I you know, I tried to present the character in that way that, you um, you know, he didn't denigrate other people or run down other people, maybe individuals like Bret Hart or things like that. But no, uh, you know, I certainly tried to uh, to do that in a way where, you know, it would be a character that, that would appeal to all regardless of nationality. When you, uh, the whole thing with Al Perez, I ended up getting you the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Inspirational Wrestler Award. Was that a big deal for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're talking about, you know, a guy that, uh, you know, I, I knew nobody in that business. I had no family in that business. I, you know, uh, whatever little bit of success I had, you know, came through hard work and through dedication and through trying to do things the right way. And and um, so, yeah, to have that uh, presented to me was, uh, that was a big deal to me. Absolutely. And back then, you know, the wrestling magazines were still a pretty good deal. I yeah, mean, that was, definitely. you know, in the infancy of computers and stuff like that, really, and the Internet. So a lot of people still bought, the, uh, you know, the publications and the magazines. And I think that was probably one of the better-selling magazines was PWI. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, that was like and a, I took that, as a, took that as a big deal, sure did. Yeah, because when I was a kid, you know, the magazines are, I, in fact, I've started collecting them again, and I feel like that's actually a good way to get a pulse of what was going on in wrestling at the time. Right. Better than TV or anything, because, you know, it's a tapestry, but if you get those magazines, you get an idea of what the fans are going for, because, you know, they're not going to put something in the magazine if it's not going to sell. No, and, and I'll tell you, uh, what I would do as a kid, when Saturdays was the day, uh, you know, my mom worked, both of my parents worked, nine to five jobs, so the only opportunity my mom would have to go to the grocery store, and this is way, way back before... 24-hour Walmarts, uh, you know, I was born in 1961, so this is in the late 60s, early 70s, um, the, uh, we'd go to the grocery store on Saturdays, and, and, you know, in grocery stores, and they still do, but back then, though, they were always in the front of the grocery stores, the magazine rack, yeah. and, and while my mom was getting groceries, I would just sit there and look through every wrestling magazine on that rack, and just, those guys in those magazines, to me, were just larger than life, I mean, I was a huge sports fanatic as a kid, and I would get Streets and Smith baseball, Streets and Smith football, basketball, and love football. But to me, those guys that were in the wrestling magazines were the coolest, biggest, baddest dudes of any sports book that I looked at. There was just something about them. And uh, I, I would just sit there mesmerized looking at those wrestling magazines, so... Yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from about those. Well, I remember I was about uh, seven or eight. I was in Gunnersville, and when I was a kid, I'd go look at the magazines, and my mama would tell me to come on, and I remember I accidentally stole two magazines doing that because I was just so enthralled in it, and I really didn't mean to. You know, I just walked out to the car looking, and then I got in the car. I said, oh, no, and I tried to take it back, and my mother was already halfway home, and she's exhausted. She said, forget it. Just buy one next time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, 
uh, Bill Eady left eventually. Eddie Gilbert became the booker in Global. All right. Okay. What did anything change for you when uh, Eddie Gilbert came in? Well, Eddie had that. Uh, you could tell Eddie had that uh, that Memphis blood running through his veins because you know it was later on then when Eddie and Doug got there that they did the the deal, the, the, the angle where uh, the Dark Patriots sprayed something in my eye, mysterious mist, and. You know, I think they even used some flash paper a couple of times. So just stuff that came from Memphis that you would see guys doing Memphis. Um, nothing wrong with that, just a different way of doing things. But, yeah, I mean, you could see, you know, uh, the difference in, in, in Eddie's way of thinking and doing things. Yeah, I actually had Doug Gilbert on the show uh, about a year ago, and he talked about uh, enjoying working with you. Yeah, I, I, I liked Doug. I hadn't seen Doug in a number of years like Eddie. And then, you know, enjoyed working with Eddie. And, uh, you know, just unfortunate that, um, you know, died young. Yeah. As have so many guys yeah. uh, in that industry. Yeah, I was looking at something the other day, you know, and I was thinking about Andre the Giant. You know, he was only 42 when he died. Yeah, I uh, saw Andre not long before he died because uh, he would come over and, and work. Uh, a couple of tours a year for Baba, and um, it wouldn't work the whole tour. He'd come in maybe about halfway through a three-week tour, maybe work the last week, and uh, actually had the opportunity uh, to work with him in some tag matches. Uh, probably three or four times they put me and Baba, to, I mean me and Andre together, and and in some tag matches. And uh, so I'm uh, glad that I got to know him and work with him and, and, and be around him. Were you partners, or were you working against him? So we were partners. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, now one time we worked a six-man tag match against each other. Uh, I don't know who the other guys involved were, but he was one of, you know, three, and I was one of three. But all the other times, it was he and I together as a tag team working against other guys. That had to be a, I mean, that had to be a big honor to get to work with Andre the Giant, because it, even at the end, he was still such a larger in life, a huge star. I mean, he just gave across an aura about him. Yeah, it was, and, and, and again, for me, <coughs> I got, to, in the beginning of my career, and uh, you know, I got to work with guys that I sat on the floor of a grocery store while my mom shopped, and I saw these guys in magazines, Andre being one of them, uh, Wahoo being one of them, uh, Harley Race, I got to work with Harley, uh, against Harley Race, uh, Dory Funk, how many times I worked with Dory, so... It was. I mean, it was an honor that I'm being able to work with guys that, that literally, as a 10-year-old kid, uh, a 12-year-old kid, I'm, I'm thumbing through magazines just, you know, amazed by these guys, and now I'm getting to work with them. So, yeah, certainly Andre fell in that category. And I think as anybody that's ever met Andre and been around Andre would say, just an absolute class guy. I mean, a, a true gentleman. Uh, if I can go back to Global for a second, how was it, uh, what did you think when you first heard about the Dark Patriot angle? I thought it was a good idea. Um, uh, I thought it was a real good idea. Uh, you know, there was nothing else there really or no other reason there that you could come up with for a, for a hot angle or, you know, some heat with other guys. I mean, Scotty the body, I mean, what's, you know, what's he going to be there? I mean, I worked against him a few times, um, you know, uh, uh, John, uh, what was his name? Anyway, I, I thought it was a good idea. John who? Tatum. Yeah, John Tatum. I've worked Tatum a few times, but he was more goofy, you know, with the way things he did things in the ring. So, I mean, it made sense. I thought it was pretty logical. Yeah, I've always really liked I'm a, I'm a sucker for uh, mask and also evil hero uh, things, you know, like the dark side of someone. Well. Or the dark side. Know, absolutely. And, and, if you can't have a good villain without a good, good guy. You can't have a great, good guy without a real bad, bad guy. You know, I mean, it's, that was basic stuff back in the early days of movies. The white hat cowboys and the black hat cowboys. It was, it was distinct lines, good versus bad. Uh, now, were you there, were you still there when Eddie Gilbert ended up leaving? Because I believe the money dried up in Global at that time, like the investors pulled out or something. Well... The, the investors that they thought they were originally were gonna, was gonna they were gonna get was some rich guy from Africa, 
Uh, and I don't know if that was a work. I don't know if they were being played, let alone. But it ended up being a lady from Atlanta, Carol, Carol Lindsay, and uh, who had some money, but she wasn't a rich lady by any means. And it was her money that ran out. But I'm pretty sure that I may have left by that time because, uh, you know, during the Patriot gimmick, uh, and, and it had really become a popular character, popular gimmick, and my career was really starting to take off. So if that was the time. Uh, Jimmy Suzuki was a guy that originally got me booked in Japan. I don't know if you know Jimmy, but... Um, he, uh, he worked for one of the magazines in Japan, but he lived in Dallas. And uh, so when that very first tour I did as the trooper really didn't go well, uh, I never heard from him again until uh, I started working for Global, and they saw Jimmy sent him some of my tapes, and I didn't know that he had. And he called me back. He said, look, you've gotten better. You know, you, you've gotten experience. You, you, you know, they love it. They want you to come back. To, to all Japan, and I'm pretty sure I left Global. Uh, Baba had asked me to come there before uh, before Eddie left, I think. Okay, because I was just wondering about that, because I remember it was the whole thing, because I think Eddie was the champion there, and he left with the belt. Yeah, I, yeah, I think all that happened after I left. I'm pretty okay. sure it did. Uh, when you got to all Japan, uh, were you more prepared this time? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I made sure. I watched, uh, I watched tape out of my ears. Uh, and plus, I was just, I mean, it's like anything, no matter what you do. If you're, a, you know, uh, if you're a car salesman, if you're a football player, uh, you know, if you're a businessman, I mean, early in your career, you're not that good. You get better as, as you gain experience. So yes. just through do, doing it longer, I was better and uh, had better psychology of the business. And, and, and I went in. My first tour back, and immediately, uh, you know, I was working with the top guys there. I mean, ASAP. Uh, you know, I'm working in matches with Gordy and Doc and working in matches with Hanson and, and Johnny Ace and, and working in matches with Kabashi and Kawada. And, um, you know, they, they had me with partners like Johnny Smith and, and uh, things like that. But, but yeah, I'm eventually, you know, working semi-main event matches, I mean, literally within a week of being there. Yeah, you, uh, I saw one match of your, one of the matches I saw was a match you had with Stan Hansen, and, you know, uh, I really enjoyed it, because, I mean, it was just some real hard-hitting action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jackie, Jackie Fulton told me one time after Stan and I had worked together, and it was basically just a, a chop test. You know, we just, and, and, I started taking my open hand and just slapping Stan across his chest instead of going sideways and chopping him. And I was, Stan was easy to aggravate. I mean, you could get under Stan's skin real quick, and I don't like it. Think a lot of me, good man. But Jackie said, he said it was just crack, crack, crack. He said, man, you guys were just wearing each other out. But yeah, you know, you, uh, listen, uh, it, it was, uh, again, it was a privilege to work with Stan. I, there's never been a, an American that's worked in that country that's as iconic as Stan is. I mean, Stan is godlike in Japan. You know, the one thing I was really impressed about watching the match is that sometimes Stan Hansen will take on guys, particularly any Americans they bring in, and it seems like the other guy can't quite get credibility when he's beating up Hansen, but when you were beating up Hansen, it's like, uh, I completely bought it because you looked like a dude that could give as good as he gets. Well, you know, a lot of times Stan would not he wouldn't sell for guys. Stan, you know, I remember one time I went out over there. I don't know who my partner was. It may have been Johnny Smith. But we worked against the Fantastics, against uh, uh, Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers. And I think I let them give me a double hip toss. I wasn't going to let either one of them because of their size. I respected those guys. They were good workers, but they were small. And I wasn't going to let either one of them body slam me or suplex me. or You know, I wasn't going to take a bump for either one of them. But I did let him give me a double hip toss. Well, once the match was over, Stan pulled me aside and he said, man, you can't do that. And he said, those guys are midget-like. He said, I don't care if they both of them give you a hip toss. He said, just don't sell it. Just block it. And he said, uh, so I'll learn things like that from Stan. And if Stan had respect for you, 
understand, we'd work with you, he'd sell for you. But if he felt it was going to be anything to hurt his image and to hurt his character and to hurt his gimmick, he wouldn't budge. I mean, his, his boots would be nailed to the, to the canvas. But I always uh, felt like there was a mutual respect there between Stan and I. Yeah, well, you really, you got to look out for yourself because people, because, you know, it's most things in life, you know, uh, if you're too giving, people don't respect it. No, yeah. absolutely not. And, Stan had a lot of heat with some of the guys over there because Stan would do things like that. Stan, listen, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a match, a tag match against Stan, where, let's say Stan's partner was um, Barry Horowitz and my partner was Jackie Fulton. And they wanted to start the match. And they had this huge spot worked out for the first, or a series of spots for the first few minutes of the match. Well, immediately when they would lock up, Stan would just come blowing in the ring and just, Beat both of them up. I saw, I saw him beat Horowitz up one night and throw him out of the ring. He beat Jackie up and threw him out of the ring and motioned for me to come in and we just started all over. So Stan did what was going to be best for Stan. How would uh, Old Japan uh, put together matches? Well, you had a finish. Uh, they would come to you and give you a finish. But uh, again, that was up to you and, and the guys you were working with to do everything in between. But now, if it were TV, or if it were a show in the three big cities, Tokyo, Osaka, or Nagoya, didn't even have to be TV. But when we worked those towns, there was always some of our biggest houses, uh, most rabid fans. Um, your matches were, I mean, you knew what was going to happen from beginning to end. I mean, there was no room for error. And, um, I mean, I've had plenty 30-minute matches where... I mean, you had to know everything from the, the first minute to the 30th minute. Uh, but otherwise, if it were just a house show somewhere, a spot show somewhere, then, you know, you just come up. They, they, literally, they'd walk in and, and say to them, you know, Patriot, uh, you know, you catch, uh, you know, you catch uh, Kamala, uh, you know, and then they'll let you guys come up with it like that. And, they, and, 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 and the... Baba or Fuchi, none of those guys that were, you know, really in charge there ever, ever told you what they just said who, who was going over, who wasn't. That was basically it. It was up to us to come up with the finish. Um, uh, something I've been curious about, because I know today, or at least for the last uh, 15 years on WWF, uh, WWE, they have, like, the referees have earplugs to keep up with the time of the match. How back yeah. then would they, because uh, because I'm, I guess they would probably give you, like, they'd say you got 15 minutes or something. How would they keep up with the time? Well, when I was working for WWE and even WCW, they had here to be in. Okay. Um, yeah, and you had guys back behind the curtain on the monitor, you know, uh, with a headset on that would tell. And a, but, but now when I worked in Japan and other places like that, you would just tell the refs, hey, you know, give me a cue at 15, give me a cue at 10. And um, the best referees, I'm telling you, the best referees, it's not even close. The best referees were the referees in all Japan. And they knew every single move. Like I told you earlier, if it was a 30-minute match and it was TV and, and I had to have everything memorized, and so did the guys I was working against, so did the referees. They were phenomenal. And, uh, of course, there was somebody that was standing, you know, back in a doorway somewhere, and, and they would look up and they'd give them a cue uh, when they needed it. But those guys, those referees in Japan didn't miss anything. They were unbelievably good. When you were, uh, another match I saw was when you got to work Kenta Kobashi one-on-one, and Kobashi almost, because I remember when I first got into Japanese wrestling, he wasn't necessarily a favorite of mine, but over time he's grown on me, especially when he's working with Americans. He seems like he's, he seems much more animated, like you said earlier. Yeah, he was one of the few Japanese that would show emotion, and he had good fire and good emotion. Toughest human being that I have ever worked with. Uh, probably one of the nicest guys I've ever worked with. Worked against him. They, they, they tagged us up together for a while as tag team partners. Later on, it was me, him, and Johnny Ace as tag team partners. But uh, I'm telling you, uh, he didn't let you do anything to him. Uh, he never complained. Uh, I mean, just physically one of the toughest human beings. And I think, in my opinion, one of the greatest workers I've ever watched work. Yeah. Uh, now, how much English did the All Japan guys know? They knew enough to communicate. Um, uh, you know, but it, 
the top guys, Zawa, yeah, Cowie, uh, Kawada, you very seldom sat down with them and went over a finish. Now, Kabashi would. Kabashi would come into your room uh, and, and go over the finish if you were working against him um, to make sure he got it right. But the other three, would, you'd never see them before you went to the ring. The referees would bring the finish over. And, uh, you know, you would, if there was something you wanted to change or if you wanted to input something, that was fine. But the referee would run and deliver it from, from their locker room to our locker room. And uh, so that's why I'm saying these referees were good. They had these matches memorized as well. But, uh, no, you never went over anything with Kawada, Cowway, and Mrs. Howard. When you never saw them. No, go ahead. No, I said you never saw them. Uh, you know, it, it was amazing. When, it, when I first started tagging with Kabashi, it was funny. I would have to ride the Japanese bus, which was the most boring thing. They, they don't talk. They don't communicate with each other. Uh, then you'd get on the American bus after a match and, you know, it's beer, it's uh, screaming, yelling, laughing, high-fiving, music playing. And it was a rowdy scene, and you're on their bus, and it's just like, like a funeral home, but uh, just the difference in, in, in culture. Did the Japanese wrestlers socialize with the American wrestlers after shows? No. No. They, they, they were on separate buses. They stayed in separate hotels, typically in a separate part of the town. And uh, so, no, we would very seldom see uh, one of the few times that we did, um, Tawei and I got to be pretty good buddies. And uh, a couple of times, he and his wife uh, invited me and Johnny out, took us out, actually had us over at their home one time, um, took us out and fed us on a couple of other occasions, gave us some nice gifts. So I socialized with Tawei on a few occasions. Uh, the only other time I ever socialized with any of them, with any, and he had the least personality of any of them, was Kawada. But one night, Ace and I had been out and uh, had been drinking, and we called him at about 2 o'clock in the morning, called his hotel room, and uh, told him he was about us if he didn't come out and meet us. 30 minutes later, he showed up, and uh, we stayed out until about sun up. And, uh, but that's the very few occasions we'd ever socialize with him. Were there any, uh, and I'm always curious about this, about the Japanese, were there any politics in Japanese locker rooms compared to America? No. No. Alright, now around this time, how did you, when did you get the offer to go to WCW? Well, when I worked in, in when I was doing the Trooper at the AWA, Eric Bischoff was our, was our color analyst. He was our yeah. uh, boy, voice on the show, so I knew Eric there. And he contacted me. He had just got the job. One of them was there. And WBO actually run right, right, right. Yeah. So he called me and said, look, man, I have a man and work over you. And I wanted to get back to the States. Again, I always preferred working in Japan. But you'd be gone for three or four weeks at a time. And it was just tougher on your body. Yeah, and, I had to run uh, ragged. I was ready to, uh, ready to get back to the States where I could see my family more. I had young kids. Yeah. And I was uh, I was ready for something that was less taxing on my body, which is the American way of doing things, and pro wrestling is a lot easier on your body. So I was ready. I was ready to get back. Yeah. Now, when you first came in, you were doing singles matches, and eventually they paired you with Marcus Bagwell. Yeah, they did. And uh, Greg Gagne was one of the bookers. Uh, it was booked by committee again, and Greg was there. And of course, I had a good relationship with Greg, and I knew Marcus from the global days. So right. Him in, he worked, worked as a handsome stranger. And uh, I said, look, man, we, we need a good baby face tag team here. He said, would you be opposed as if we put Marcus with you? And and they, they already had the idea. They said, you know, we're, we're going to base it on your gimmick, the Patriot. And, uh, he's going to be in red, white, and blue tights. And, and call his stars and stripes. And 